Hi, everyone. This is Jonathan Kemmer with the American Meshon Breeders Association. I'm going to start by asking, what does Okinawa, Sardinia, Icaria, and Nicoya have in common? And if you've been watching the Blue Zones show on Netflix, you'll know these are places of the world that have been studied for their longevity, meaning that the people who live here tend to live to be like 90 and 100 years old. However, the other thing they have in common is pigs. Uh, each of them have a, a breed of pig that originated from these places. Now, unfortunately, the Chooch and the Icaria Island pigs are extinct. The Sarda and the Agu pig were nearly extinct, though fortunately they are making a recovery. However, they don't really talk about this in the TV show. And I think in general, it's undercounted how much pork is a part of their diets. I think this is in part because of a bias and in part just because of underreporting or, or not good serving. Um, the bias is that the term Blue Zones itself is trademarked and owned by Adventist Health, which is owned by the Adventist Church, which is religiously vegetarian. It's part of their religion to be vegetarian. Um, I also think it just comes from surveying. If you remember my first video on the history of pigs in China, um, the Chinese farmers who raised these pigs, they would you know, they'd butcher them, they would eat the meat sometimes, but they would eat the fat nearly every day because these pigs produce a, just an enormous amount of fat, and that's just what they cook all their vegetables and things in. So when these people are asked, what are you eating? And they say beans or squash or sweet potatoes. What they're not being asked is, well, how did you cook it? And what did you cook it in? Because most of the time, pork fat. Um, I think there's another limitation with language. For example, with Sardinia, um, they use different words for things like charcuterie, like the salami or the terrines or the pâtés that they're making. Um, and so if you ask someone from Sardinia, how much pork do you eat? They'll say maybe not very much because they're thinking pork chops or pork shoulder or roasts or things like that. But if you ask them how much do you eat salami, they'll say, well, just about every day it's on the table. Um, so I think there's a few ways in which it's um, been undercounted how much pork is a part of these people's diets. So for example, Okinawa Island Guide, this is a publication used to promote uh, tourism in Okinawa, says that you can't really talk about Okinawan cuisine without discussing pork. It's an essential ingredient for a number of home cooking dishes. Uh, second thing here is going to be a research paper on uh, diets all over Japan. Um, and what it says is that basically because Okinawa is not as much influenced by Buddhism, there isn't as much taboo around eating animals. Uh, and so it's not stigmatized as much. And you see higher consumption of meat, especially pork, uh, compared to the rest of Japan and more longevity. And in fact, it goes to explain uh, they did not find any vegetarians among the centenarians. Uh, so regarding Costa Rica, this is an interview with Gina Baker by the Weston Price Foundation. Uh, two different interviews, in fact. Uh, she lived in Costa Rica for a long time, spent a lot of time with centenarians in Nicoya, and talks about how lard especially was a big part of these people's diet. Um, that you'd have families that would slaughter pigs once a month. That would yield up to like five gallons of lard, and that was enough for, uh, cooking fat for seven to eight people for a month. Um, so if you do the math on that, that's about a third of a cup of pork fat per day that each person is consuming. However, what I want to stress is that this is very different pork than what we have here in America. Um, not just grocery store pork, uh, different even than the so-called pasture-raised or forest-raised, the type of pork even that you see coming from regenerative farms. I don't think is is as good for human health as the pork that these folks are eating. Uh, and so I want to get into why that is. A lot of it has to do with traditional versus modern breeds. Um, and I think that not only can Meishans produce healthier pork than these breeds, uh, they can do so more efficiently. So this is a study specifically on the Agu. This is a pig from Okinawa basically comparing the, the meat and the fat traits. Um, so they took pigs that were 70 kilograms, raised them to 110 kilograms. Commercial pigs did it in 170 days. Agu did it in 227. Obviously a slower growing breed, taking almost 50 more days to grow just as much. Um, lower hang weight too, relative to the live weight. So the dressing percentage, uh, commercial pigs were better. Uh, more than twice as much back fat, more than twice as much intermuscular fat in the Okinawan pig and a higher pressed juice percentage, which just means juicier pork.
Uh, it says that the agu pigs exhibited higher concentrations of C16, which is saturated fat and monounsaturated fat, but much lower concentration of polyunsaturated fat. I'll explain why this is important later. Um, it says the result is consistent with previous studies on the composition of fatty acids in indigenous pigs. It goes on to say that these characteristics of low lean meat productivity, high fat deposition is consistent with all sorts of studies on all sorts of other breeds from all over the planet. Iberian pigs, which are from Spain, Meishan and Xinhua, which are from China, Basque pigs from southern France and northern Spain, and Creole pigs, which you find in the Mediterranean, or excuse me, the Caribbean, especially Haiti. Um, but across the board, you see these very common characteristics and this very common dichotomy between these traditional breeds, also called aut autochthonous, land race, I've seen people call them village pigs, um, versus your modern commercial pig. So these old breeds, they are created through genetic isolation. People don't really set out to create them. You just have pigs that get somewhere and they stay there long enough without an influx of new genetics that eventually you get a homogenization. Um, there's not really a written standard, so you tend to see more variation. Uh, for example, if you look at like Kuni Kuni or the Mingalitsas, they tend to come in different colors. Um, I know with the Meishans, there was originally three or four different types and when the Chinese government took over the breeding them in the mid 1900s, even then they still kept two different types. Um, these pigs were for sustenance farming, so they weren't raised at a large scale. They typically weren't raised in manipulated environments and rather natural environment. Um, so not as much separation from the elements in terms of weather and, and biosecurity tends to be much hardier pigs. So that comes down to things like defense in genes and a um, more active gut microbiome, creating a gut junction barrier. Um, these are slower growing pigs. They produce a very different type of muscle tissue, which I'll go into detail about. And they also synthesize a lot of fat. Um, so not only tend to be fattier, but they actually create the fat themselves. Whereas you compare that to your modern pigs, your um, commercial pigs, these pigs are created very intentionally with a very sophisticated understanding of genetic inheritance. They have a written standard. You have, you know, state fairs, breeding contests, uh, traditionally speaking, that um, people all over try and see who can breed the best pig to this very specific standard. Um, they're bred to function in a very controlled environment. This is a part of just breeding. The more things you breed an animal to do, the harder it is to make more headway in any given direction. Um, so if you can kind of limit the things that you're breeding for, you can get there more effectively. So for example, if your goal is to get a very lean, quick growing pig, it's easier to do that if you don't have to breed for disease resistance, you don't have to breed for their ability to, to thrive in incredibly cold or incredibly hot environments. So they just modify those environments. They medicate the pigs, they put them in a hog house that's temperature controlled and, and all of that. But what you end up with is a much more muscular, quick growing pig, um, also much leaner. And this is mostly done by shutting down their ability to synthesize or create fat. They still store a lot of fat from their diet. So this also creates fat content that is disproportionately more based on their diet uh, to the overall fat um, and creates a very different type of muscle tissue. So the types of muscle tissue that pigs can create is referred to as the myosin heavy chain isoforms. Um, it's not an all or nothing black or white kind of thing. It's very much a, a spectrum. If you take a, a piece of meat from a pig, there's gonna be muscle bundles and they're gonna contain all these different isoforms. So like I said, it's kind of a spectrum on, um, with the traditional breeds, you, that spectrum leans more towards your type one. And with your commercial breeds, it leans more towards your type two B. Um, if you want to read more about that, the study that I posted below, the evaluation of myosin heavy chain isoforms is going to be good to read. Um, the second one is basically just a source showing that Meishan pigs have a more of a genetic inclination to create this type of muscle tissue. Um, so this is finer tissue. It's associated with higher meat quality due to things like drip loss and pH. It's very much red meat pork, whereas the type 2B is going to be your white meat pork. It's tougher, drier, all of that. The way that this pertains to human health, though, is that the color has to do with the concentration of myoglobin. 
and myoglobin contains things like iron, uh, vitamins B1, uh, which has been shown to have a great impact on, on cholesterol. Um, so there is a value to human health in having red or pork, basically. And uh, these are some pictures of my pork from some Maishan pigs taken by customers of mine. On the left, you have um, pork shoulder that was smoked. On the right, you have ground pork. Um, in both instances, this is a modern commercial Duroc versus my Maishan pigs. And you can see drastic difference in the color. Um, but as we're talking about it relating to human health, we're really talking about the fat, like I mentioned. Um, a lot of these people probably didn't eat pork all that much in terms of pieces of meat, but they definitely consumed a lot of fat. Uh, this is a really great paper on the difference between traditional and modern breeds as it relates to the way in which they produce fat and, and some of the repercussions of that. Um, so again, what I was saying, modern pigs bred for leanness, efficiency, quicker growth, whereas the local breeds are selected more towards their ability to thrive in their local environments. Oftentimes that includes things like food shortages. Um, looking at like the Sarda pig, they were raised somewhat similar to what you see in a lot of Spain where they were kind of half feral browsing on things like acorns and tree mass, roots and tubers. So obviously there's going to be a huge availability difference from season to season. You know, when they're dropping acorns, there's a ton of food through the winter, maybe not so much. Um, in a lot of these places, you know, we're talking about small poor sustenance farmers. They themselves probably dealt with food insecurity. So certainly their pigs are going to. So basically the pigs developed the ability to put on an enormous amount of fat and then um, use that fat when there were food shortages. So they do that by synthesizing the saturated fat, then they convert that fat into monounsaturated fat when they need to access those calories. So that is what kind of creates this distinctive fat metabolism differences between your traditional breeds and your modern breeds and why your traditional breeds not only create so much fat, but such drastically different fat than what you see. Um, this paragraph here in the middle kind of talks about how that's why you see more monounsaturated fat in these pigs is that as they bred pigs to be leaner, they shut down both the ability to synthesize fat and the ability to convert that saturated fat into monounsaturated fat, basically the ability to desaturate fat and why across the board you so consistently see such a different fat content in these local or traditional breeds. So as it pertains to human health, um, this is very controversial. I think a lot of people probably have different opinions on things. Uh, saturated fat used to be pretty demonized. I think we're starting to understand now it's not quite as bad as people thought, um, but definitely a difference of opinions. You have people in like the carnivore camp, like Saladino, who thinks you can eat saturated fat all day, not care about your LDL and you'll be fine. Um, People in maybe a more moderate camp like Peter Atia, who do consume a lot of saturated fat, but does keep an eye on their LDL cholesterol. Um, as far as saturated fat affecting LDL cholesterol, we are starting to find that the type of saturated fat matters. Um, there are several different types of saturated fat. Uh, they're described sort of by their chemical structure. So you have some that are shorter chain, some that are longer chain. The longer chain fats, say for example, like steric acid, C18, they've actually been shown to have zero effect on LDL cholesterol. You can eat steric acid all day long, won't increase your LDL cholesterol. However, the shorter chains, things like C12, C14, lauric and myric acid, um, they have been shown to in more increase your LDL cholesterol because they transport more LDL cholesterol in your blood system. Um, one of the other things that people point to as a benefit of saturated fat is satiety. It makes you feel full longer. So that can help you with cravings of eating junk food. If you're into things like fasting or um, temporarily fasting, um, they can help with that. The thing that makes saturated fat really tricky is just that there's so much context that has to do with your diet and your lifestyle, metabolism, how much you exercise, the other things that you have in your diet. Um, so again, very controversial. Uh, with monounsaturated fat, that seems to be a little bit less controversial. It's what's most widely found in your Mediterranean diet. So this is what you find in like olive oil and a lot of nuts and things like that. Uh, and then you have the polyunsaturated fat. This is also very controversial because for the longest time, this was considered the healthy fat. You know, your saturated fats are the animal fats. They were bad. 
uh, polyunsaturated fat, plant fats, good. And we're starting to understand that that's not exactly the case and very much like saturated fat. It really depends on the type of polyunsaturated fat and specifically the balance between omega-3 and omega-6. Um, I think that's the most important thing to consider with pork, just because pork, especially when they're fed corn, can be a big source of polyunsaturated fat, especially omega-6 saturated fat. Um, so this is a really great paper if you're interested in understanding more about the balance of omega-6 to omega-3, um, actually written by a local doctor here in Kansas City and one other person. Uh, and they point out that uh, prior to 100 years ago, the typical human diet, you didn't have more than a four to one ratio of omega-6 to 3. However, in the last 100 years, we see diets that are 20 to 1 or worse. It really has to do with things like soybean oil, canola oil, and pork and poultry that are fed corn. Um, increase has also paralleled the rise in numerous autoimmune, inflammatory, and allergic diseases. Um, in general, omega-3 is used by the body to resolve or lower inflammation. Omega-6 is used primarily for increasing inflammation. It is important that we're able to do both. Increasing inflammation is how you fight disease. However, if you have a diet that has way out of whack with way too much omega-6 and you're constantly inflamed, then you start having a lot of these problems with autoimmune and inflammatory and allergic diseases. Um, Additionally, it's believed that um, linoleic acid, a specific type of omega-6 fatty acid that you find in corn and corn-fed animals, is likely associated with um, obesity. So an increase of this in your diet can uh, create a lot more problems with obesity. Um, so this paper would also be worth checking out if that's something you're interested in. Um, but as it pertains to pigs, uh, pigs are what they call homolipoid. So that means that they basically store their fat very directly. And the fat content um, of pork fat can be very much reflective of what they're consuming. Um, and specifically what they're consuming at the end of their life. Um, there are a lot, of, there is a lot of research on this, especially since like dried distiller grains and corn byproducts from ethanol production are starting to make their way into commercial pork. Um, you can actually drastically change the, the pig's fat content in uh, just a short period of time. So in this, we're looking at pigs that were fed a barley, wheat, and soybean diet just for the last 11 weeks prior to butcher. Uh, and they produced an omega-6 to 3 ratio of 4.5 to 1, whereas the corn-fed pigs were at 14.3 to 1. Um, so again, just taking out the corn and substituting it for the last 11 weeks had that significant of a diet where it went from 14 to one to four and a half to one. Now, people might remark that, well, there's soybeans in there. Soybeans are high fat. Soybean meal, which is fed to pigs, usually doesn't have fat. Soybeans are crushed. The fat is expelled. The, the rest of it is roasted, and that's what's fed to pigs. Soybean meal that is fed to pigs is usually lower than 2% in fat, which is lower than even the barley. So it's really just the corn in pig diets that are making the omega-6 to 3 ratio so out of whack. Um, so again, if the ideal human diet is less than 1 to 4 to 1, um, you can get pretty close by, by substituting the, the corn in their diet. Um, the other way of doing that is by substituting the corn in their diet with pasture. Uh, so this was a study done by John Arbuckle. It was a SAR grant funded study um, where basically he had his pigs being raised on pasture with a full corn based diet. Uh, he had other pigs that their ration was cut in half. The rest was what they consumed on pasture. And then he had one that was entirely pasture based. All their diet was from pasture. And then I believe he also fed like powdered milk or something as a protein supplement. Um, he then went out and bought some pork from the grocery store and had that analyzed as well. Um, so the grocery store pork ended up having a 29.4 to 1 omega 6 to 3 ratio, um, whereas his uh, full grain but on pasture was closer to 14 to 1, 13.84. What I disagree with about this study is they tried to conclude that just putting the pigs on pasture cuts the uh, omega-6 to 3 ratio in half, and I very much disagree with that. Um, we don't know what the grocery store pigs were fed, and so that's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison because you're comparing them to pigs that we know what they were fed. Um, like I said, there's been a huge increase in the amount of dried distiller grains fed to pigs in commercial pork. 
Um, and that is a higher concentration of omega-6 than just corn. And what likely would have increased the, the uh, omega-6 polyunsaturated. And I also say that because the 100% grain group uh, being at 14 to 1, that's very similar to the other study we just saw that were pigs not raised on pasture with a corn-based diet. They were also 14 to 1. Um, so I don't think you can attribute that 29 to 1 down to 14 to 1 uh, just by putting pigs on pasture. 14 to 1 is very consistent with what we see with other pigs not raised on pasture that are fed corn. So anyhow, when he drops the grain to 50% of their diet, that lowers the 6 to 3 ratio down close to 10 to 1, entirely grain-free down to 5 to 1, uh, which is still around or slightly above what happens when you feed the pigs you know, barley and wheat instead of corn. So traditionally, that's been the two levers that we have to pull is that you can either substitute the corn with pasture or you can substitute the corn with something that's lower in, in fat like barley or wheat. Um, however, I think what's really interesting is some new research out of China showing that pigs, indigenous Chinese pigs may actually do this better naturally. Um, so this was a study that was not done with the intention of understanding pork fat for the value of human health. Um, the point was actually to figure out why it is that pork from uh, indigenous Chinese pigs have a unique and interesting flavor compared to other types of pork. Um, so it's a multivariate analysis um, looking at all these different compounds that have an influence on pork flavor. And what they found was that the unique flavor of Chinese pigs comes from an increase in certain fatty acids. And these fatty acids happen to include oleic acid, which is the monounsaturated fat that's in olive oil. DHA, which is an omega-3 fatty acid that you find in fish and marine sources, uh, and ALA, which is the omega-3 fatty acid that you find in things like chia seed and flax seed. Um, so they just naturally produce more omega-3 fatty acids. And when you sit and you look and compare the fatty acid profile in this study, the commercial pig on a commercial diet ends up being around 15 to 1, where the laiwu, the Chinese pig, is around 10 to 1. Um, unfortunately, it does not say exactly what the diet is. I have to assume that this is going to be a corn-based diet because the, um, the omega-6 to 3 ratio of the commercial pig is very similar to the last couple studies we saw of a, uh, of a pig on a corn-based diet. But the same diet, you cut that down to 10 to 1. So just by having this Chinese breed of pig, you have the same effect of John Arbuckle's study where he cut out half of their feed. So we now have a second study here, um, which is again, comparing Chinese pigs to a commercial pig and then the Beijing black, which is a breed that was created from both Chinese and commercial type pigs. Uh, and they found basically the same thing, increased um, EPA and DHA, omega-3 fatty acids, and a little bit more monounsaturated fat. Um, the difference, however, is the omega-3 to 6 ratio in the commercial pig. Again, this doesn't tell exactly what their diet is. It just says it's a commercial diet. Um, I know that China imports a lot of Milo, uh, which they feed animals. But the commercial pigs in this study had a um, three to six ratio of around one to five, which is really similar to that study where they fed pigs on barley and wheat. However, even with a diet that produces a better three to six ratio on the commercial pigs, the Chinese pigs still had a better ratio. So if the one to four ratio is the ideal for human health, having Chinese pigs and not feeding them corn, you can actually get a very, very healthy omega-3 to 6 fatty acid profile. Um, relating this back to the point, which is, you know, the pork that was consumed in these blue zones or areas of longevity, they were not feeding their pigs corn, so they were probably seeing pork with a better omega-3 to 6 ratio. The other factor is just going to be that, again, these pigs synthesize a lot more fat. So even if you do have polyunsaturated fat with a bad 3 to 6 ratio, that's being watered down or diluted because the overall fat content is significantly higher in saturated fat and monounsaturated fat. And that polyunsaturated fat is now a, a lesser portion. So when you consume a third a cup or whatever the people in Nicoya were, much less of that is going to be this unhealthy polyunsaturated fat. So how this happens, I don't really know. 
Um, these are very new studies. And again, they were just trying to figure what distinguishes Chinese pork from others. They weren't looking at this from a health angle. Uh, I did one, find one really interesting study, which may explain it. They say that linoleic acid can be formed into EPA, which can be further metabolized through desaturation into DHA. Um, going back to the paper I posted about the genetic traits of old land raised pigs, they have a lot more traits that deal with sat desaturation of fats. Um, so it's, it's possible that they're just desaturating linoleic acid and converting it into healthier fats. Um, not sure exactly what the mechanism is, but we are starting to see a growing consensus that you get a much better omega-3 to 6 ratio from Chinese pigs. Um, however, I don't think that's the only thing that makes Meishan's really great pigs. Um, if we're going to compare Meishan pigs to these pigs from these areas of longevity, um, I think they also have much more um, better commercial traits. Uh, so I pulled these from different studies. The agu comes from the one I quoted at the beginning. The numbers for the sarda and the nation are below. Um, but if you take their average daily rate of gain and you multiply that over the 227 days, which was the grow out that they did for the agu to get to a market weight, during that time, the agu would have gained an average of 286 pounds. The sarda would have only gained 214 pounds, but the nation would have gained 322 pounds. So not only do they probably have the capacity to make even healthier fat than these pigs, um, they're also quicker growing pigs. The more important thing, if you're familiar with Meishans, however, is the litter sizes. While the Agu was more competitive in its growth rate, they have less than five pigs per litter. And it's really hard to be economical raising pigs that only have five pigs per litter. Um, Sarda has a higher litter rate, but then again, they were much, much slower growing pigs. Again, the sources for this is just below. Um, if I've talked to you very much at all about pigs, I've probably showed you this picture. It's one of my favorite graphics, when it, especially as it pertains to doing alternative feeds with pigs. Uh, this is from this book here, Swine Production by Bundy and Diggins, published in 1956. Um, and so what the graphic is showing is what it calls the nutritionally critical periods, which is sow's gestation up until the piglets are about 50 pounds. So that kind of line in the middle, the wider it gets, the better the feed that is needed. The dots below kind of indicate your return on investment for feeding. And so what it's pointing out is that the highest quality and the most that you need to feed is right before the sow farrows and right after, especially as she's lactating. And that is the best return on investment you will ever get for feeding pigs. So if you're feeding a sow this much, and you are getting two to three times as many pigs as a result, that has a really profound impact on the economics of producing pork. So to summarize, pork fat can and has been a really significant part of the healthiest diets in the world. However, the pork fat in these diets are very different, not just from the pork that you get from the grocery store, but even what you're seeing off of most of these regenerative farms. I mean, they may call it pasture-raised or forest-raised, but most of the time they have bulk bins that are full of corn. And if that's the case, they are going to have that 14 to 1 omega 6 to 3 ratio. Uh, and that is not very healthy pork for human consumption. Um, just by having Chinese breeds, you can drop that down to 10 to 1, it seems, which is the effect of cutting about half of the corn out of their diet. Um, and even if you do have a omega 3 to 6 ratio in your pork fat that is not optimal, uh, because of the amount of saturated and monosaturated fat, you're diluting that. Um, so you're going to have an overall much healthier pork fat. Um, not only that, but they are probably the most economical pigs I have found that produce fat like this. Uh, when you look at all these breeds that have been studied, the different land races, whether you're talking uh, Mingalitsa, Creole pigs, American Guinea hog, um, Meishans do have a much more economical uh, they have much more economical traits than any of these pigs on top of the fact that they probably consume much healthier pork fat. So thanks for checking this out. If you want to contact me, I can be reached through my website, oddbirdfarm.com. If you want to get in touch with the AMBA, you can reach out through meishonbreeders.com. We also have a Facebook group, Make Mine Meishon Pigs. Um, so if you're interested in the breed or just have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks. Mm -hmm.